we're in Jesus' Olivet Discourse, his prophetic declaration that Jerusalem and its temple were going to be destroyed in that generation. In 70 AD, it was. And those facts have to be our baseline of interpretation when we come to the Olivet Discourse. It was going to be, and it was, a horrible, catastrophic, and total destruction. As Jesus said, not one stone would be left upon another. Josephus, the first century Jewish historian and eyewitness of the event, wrote of this destruction in this way. Quote, Caesar gave orders that they should now demolish the entire city and temple, but should leave as many of the towers standing as were of the greatest eminency. And so much of the wall has enclosed the city on the west side. This wall was spared in order to afford a camp for such as were to lie in garrison, as were the towers also spared, in order to demonstrate to posterity what kind of city it was and how well fortified which the Roman valor had subdued. But for all the rest of the wall, it was so thoroughly laid even with the ground by those that dug it up to the foundation that there was left nothing to make those that came thither believe it had ever been inhabited. It was a total, total destruction. F.F. F. Bruce, the great 20th century English theologian and author, wrote this, Accordingly, in April of A.D. 70, Titus invaded Jerusalem. As the siege wore on, the horrors of famine and even cannibalism were added to the hazards of war, but the defenders had no thought of capitulating, least of all when Titus, using Josephus as his interpreter, urged the advantages of timely surrender upon them. On July 24, the Romans captured the fortress of Antonia. Twelve days later, the daily sacrifice in the temple was discontinued. On August 27, the temple gates were burnt. Two days later, on the anniversary of the destruction of the first temple by the Babylonians in 587 B.C., the sanctuary itself was set on fire and destroyed. By September 26, the whole city was in Titus's hands. It was razed to the ground, only three towers of Herod's palace on the western wall being left standing with part of the western wall itself. Now, back in Luke 21, verse 27, in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus said, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now this phrase, coming in a cloud, has caused many to believe that one day in our future, Jesus will return on a cloud. Now what many fail to note is that the term, coming in a cloud, definitely has a precedent-setting usage in the Old Testament. Just as we saw in yesterday's video, the sun, the moon, and the stars often symbolized authorities family authorities, governmental authorities, and even religious authorities, in numerous places in the Old Testament, God came in judgment in the clouds. Now, it was metaphoric. Did God literally, physically come down in the clouds? No. He came in judgment through the use of pagan armies to carry out his will. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here in the Olivet Discourse. So let's look at some examples of this in the Old Testament. In Psalm 104, and by the way, we're just going to look at a few. There are dozens. In Psalm 104, the psalmist describes God, beginning at verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty covering yourself with light as with a cloak, stretching out heaven like a tent curtain. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He walks upon the wings of the wind. He makes the winds his messengers, flaming fire his ministers. Now is this a literal 
physical description of God. No, it uses the metaphor of clouds as his chariot and flaming fire as his ministers. It is a prophetic and apocalyptic description of his judgment. In Isaiah chapter 19, verse 1, it says, Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. Now look at the language of Jeremiah describing the destruction that Babylon was going to bring on Jerusalem. And remember, by some strange coincidence, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by the Romans in 70 AD happened on the exact same day of the year as the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by the Babylonians in 557 BC. Here's what Jeremiah said leading up to the Babylonian destruction. Verse 5, Jeremiah 4, verse 5, Declare in Judah and proclaim in Jerusalem and say, Blow the trumpet in the land. Cry aloud and say, Assemble yourselves and let us go into the fortified cities. Lift up a standard toward Zion. Seek refuge and do not stand still. For I am bringing evil from the north and great destruction. A lion has gone up from his thicket and a destroyer of nations has set out. He has gone out from his place to make your land a waste. Your cities will be ruins without inhabitant. For this, put on sackcloth, lament, and wail. For the fierce anger of the Lord has not turned back from us. It shall come about in that day, declares the Lord, that the heart of the king and the heart of the princes will fail, and the priests will be appalled, and the prophets will be astounded. And then I said, Ah, oh Lord God, surely, surely you have deceived this people in Jerusalem, saying you will have peace, whereas a sword touches the throat. In that time, it will be said to this people into Jerusalem, a scorching wind from the bare heights in the wilderness in the direction of the daughter of my people, not to winnow and not to cleanse. A wind too strong for this will come at my command. And now I also pronounce judgments against them. Behold, he goes up like clouds and his chariots like the, whir the whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe to us, for we are ruined. Wash your heart from evil, O Jerusalem, that you may be saved. How long will your wicked thoughts lodge within you? Now just think about this. Is it possible that Jesus uses the exact same language of coming in the clouds to describe the destruction of Jerusalem through the Roman army in the same language that was used to describe the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonian army on the exact same day, 657 years later. Coincidence? In Ezekiel chapter 30, Ezekiel prophesies the destruction of Egypt by the Babylonian army using the same kind of language. Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 1. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord God, Wail, alas, for the day. For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. A sword will come upon Egypt, and anguish will be in Ethiopia. When the slain fall in Egypt, they take away her wealth and her foundations are torn down. Now, just one more example from the Old Testament. And I encourage you to do your own study of the clouds and the use of clouds in prophetic apocalyptic language. We're going to close it out here in the Old Testament with Daniel chapter 7, beginning at verse 13. Daniel's vision of the kingdom. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. 
And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Now clearly, this is Daniel's vision of the kingdom, the messianic kingdom. He, Jesus, the Messiah, is given dominion, an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Now, I believe this is the vision that Jesus is speaking of the night before his crucifixion and his trial before Caiaphas, the high priest. Caiaphas demands that Jesus declare whether or not he's the Messiah. Now, here's Jesus' answer in Matthew 26, verse 64. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And the high priest knew exactly what Jesus was saying and declared blasphemy, blasphemy. But Jesus says to him, hereafter you will see you will see. This coming on the clouds of heaven was Old Testament apocalyptic language of Jerusalem's destruction. Now, once again, I know that's a lot to chew on. I know that may be completely new to you. You may never have heard anybody say anything like that before. Become, here's my challenge. Become a student of the Word. Study the Word. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. Now, folks, this is good news. Jesus came in judgment on first century apostate Judaism, just as he said he was going to do. The physical city of Jerusalem, the holy city, was destroyed. But the first century followers of Jesus knew that they were citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem. The physical temple of Jerusalem was destroyed. But the first century followers of Jesus knew that they were living stones being built up into a spiritual house with a holy priesthood, not the corrupt and apostate priesthood of the first century Judaistic system. Folks, we are a part of an indestructible, unshakable kingdom, a kingdom that knows no end. And all people everywhere are invited into intimate fellowship with God and have the opportunity through faith and repentance to know him, unhindered access to the Father the tabernacle of God, the dwelling place of God is right now among men. And he is our God. And we are his people. Well, thanks for joining me today. And I hope you'll be with me again right here on Monday morning as we continue our study of the parables of Jesus and look further into what Jesus had to say about his kingdom and the Olivet Discourse. Remember, he calls us to walk in love with all people everywhere. So be a channel of his love and grace to everyone you come in contact with today. Look for the opportunities he presents you with to lead someone to faith in Jesus, the promised Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the whole world. Now, why not click on the subscribe button on the lower right corner of your screen and you'll be notified in YouTube whenever a new video gets posted. And if you're watching on Facebook, consider sharing this on your wall and invite your friends to watch it. Now, I hope you'll go out and make today a great day and have a safe 
and blessed weekend. I'll see you right here on Monday morning.